and welcome. In 1970, the successful team of Stan Lee and Jack Kirby were about to go their separate ways. Throughout the 60s, they were a team that had, in essence, established the foundation of Marvel Comics and revitalized the superhero genre. They were, unquestionably, the creative force that defined 1960s mainstream comic books. However, by the time 1970 rolled around, Jack Kirby felt his contributions to the success of Marvel Comics were completely unappreciated. And more importantly, these significant contributions were going uncompensated. This was in stark contrast to his work partner, Stan Lee, who was doing very well for himself. To give that statement some context, when the owner of Marvel Comics, Martin Goodman, sold Marvel Comics to Cadence Industries, Stan Lee was given a significant bonus in exchange for his continued, contractually guaranteed involvement with the company. Kirby also attempted to acquire a similar contract for himself during this time. Unfortunately, after negotiations, the contract presented to Kirby was insulting and dismissive. Allegedly, he was offered a standard freelance contract that offered no incentives for Kirby's continued involvement with the company, nor was there any signing bonus. The contract also included a provision to ensure he wouldn't assert any copyright claims to the material he had previously produced for Marvel. This included, but wasn't limited to, all the characters he created and the actual physical artwork. This distinct lack of respect led Kirby to quit working for Marvel Comics he immediately went to work for Marvel's direct competitor, DC. In fact, Kirby signed a contract with DC, and then he exclusively produced content for them over the next six years. At DC, Kirby pitched the grand idea of what would later be known as the Fourth World. This concept was a series of interrelated titles that would eventually tell one complete story. It would be an entirely new mythology, with superheroes taking the place of gods. This was an idea that Kirby had played around with when he worked on Thor for Marvel Comics. The original idea was to kill off Thor's supporting cast during Ragnarok, and then establish a cast of new gods to replace the old, now dead ones. He even created sketches of characters he intended to use in this grand story, most of which he would later use in the Fourth World titles. Apparently, this was a storyline Stan Lee didn't approve when Kirby presented it, so it never materialized. Kirby was going to do a similar story with the Inhumans, but he decided against it when the solo Inhumans title he was planning became part of the anthology Amazing Adventures. Kirby then retooled this new god's idea for DC, and he began to establish the foundation of the fourth world as soon as he began to officially work for DC. According to Kirby's assistants at the time, Mark Evanair and Steve Sherman, Kirby originally intended to create the fourth world titles and then step back, taking an editorial role while other creative teams worked on the concepts he initiated. One such title, Mr. Miracle, Kirby wanted to hand over to Steve Ditko once it was established, presuming, of course, that Ditko was interested in the character. However, it never got to the point where Ditko was approached to see if he would participate. While unclear, it's possible this was an idea DC tentatively agreed to when Kirby proposed it. However, at some early point, the publisher of DC, Carmine Infantino, informed Kirby he was expected to write and draw all of the Fourth World titles. Presumably, they were investing in Kirby the artist, not Kirby the editor. It's worth mentioning at this point that the Fourth World saga was a pretty loose concept. Basically, it's a misconception to say there was anything resembling a solid grand plan for all these interrelated titles. Kirby had a vague endgame in mind and a very, very loose plot for the overall story, but nothing was plotted out in detail, nor was anything written down. Kirby's intent was to go with the flow and to take as long as necessary to tell the story he wanted to tell. In other words, the overall story was fluid, and it relied on what he created along the way. This reflected Kirby's creative process. By all accounts, he wrote and drew a page concurrently. That is, there was no script prepared beforehand. The letterer inked in whatever words Kirby wrote on the artwork itself. This can be seen in photocopies Kirby made of his artwork before he sent them off to be finished by the letterer and the inker. According to Mark Evanair, Kirby intended the Fourth World titles to last roughly 18 issues each. Of course, the only title that managed to last that long was Mr. Miracle, and the focus of that title dramatically changed when the other Fourth World titles were cancelled. But again, this was a rough guideline. Had the titles been wildly successful, it's likely Kirby would have continued far past that 18-issue plan. It's probably accurate to look at the 58 issues of Fourth World content Kirby created as a rough beginning, 
there are inconsistencies, dangling plots, and hints at a grand mythology. Overall, the saga never quite forms into anything cohesive. That being said, the fourth world is a legacy. It was packed full of ideas and concepts that would be refined and expanded upon long after Kirby left DC. Before going further, let's answer one very important question. What does the fourth world mean anyway? Actually, it doesn't mean anything. Not originally, that is. Oddly enough, the fourth world is not a phrase that actually appears anywhere inside any of the related comic books. For the purposes of cheap irony, the phrase does appear on the cover of the fourth issue of each of these titles. But, that's it. The phrase originated with Jack Kirby, as one would naturally presume. And, as far as one can tell, he just liked the sound of it, and he hadn't attached any meaning to it at all. Despite this, there is a retroactive definition for what the fourth world means. The first world was basically Asgard. Asgard, or God World as it's known in fourth world mythology, was a planet where the beings living on it evolved into gods. This evolution into gods established them as the old gods, and their world subsequently transitioned into the second world. These gods eventually went to war with one another, and this war ends with God World exploding and seeding the universe with, like, God Power Juice. Some of that power ends up on Earth, which becomes the third world once superheroes begin to emerge. The fourth world is actually two worlds, New Genesis and Apocalypse, both of which were created out of the remnants of God World. The beings on both of these worlds once again evolved into gods and have become the new gods. I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that New Genesis is heaven and Apocalypse is hell. Kirby was never all that subtle with his analogies. Honestly, this is such a convoluted part of the mythology, I can't say with any confidence that I fully understand it. In the end, it is a little irrelevant, since Kirby himself didn't attach any meaning to it. Now I should take a moment and mention that the scope of this video is limited to what Jack Kirby established within the Fourth World titles. As some might accurately point out, many of the concepts and characters Kirby created have been changed or refined throughout the years. Such as, for example, the preceding explanation of the Fourth World. So within this video, there may be discrepancies between the current status of the Fourth World, or what others did with the Fourth World through the years, and what Kirby established in the early 70s. With that disclaimer in mind, let's move forward. Officially, the Fourth World saga begins in issue number 133 of the comic book Superman's Pal, Jimmy Olsen, which is an unusual choice to begin a massive cosmic epic. There are a few somewhat conflicting versions concerning why Jack Kirby took over that title. It was, after all, an odd choice for Kirby's particular skill set and experience. In fact, it kind of seemed like a title that was beneath the capabilities of Kirby. However, when Kirby landed at DC, he wanted a title where he could have the most creative control. One of the few titles DC had that they didn't really care about was Jimmy Olsen. It was one of their lowest selling titles, and it didn't have a steady creative team. So DC either offered, or heavily suggested, Kirby take control of that title. Or Jack asked to be given their lowest selling title, so he could turn it around and show DC their money was being well spent on the talent he possessed or the truth is somewhere in the middle of all those different versions. Regardless, Kirby didn't really care for Jimmy Olsen, and the interference he encountered didn't make working on the title any better. There was a house-style DC enforced for both the look of Superman and Superman-related characters, like Jimmy Olsen. And, in the first few issues of Kirby's run on that title, his artwork had new faces literally pasted over top of his original artwork. As one might imagine, this did not sit well with Kirby. Eventually, Kirby would send in the finished pages, leaving Jimmy and Superman's face penciled in, and another artist would draw and ink those faces to conform to the DC House style. Despite this title being considered canonical to the Fourth World saga, it actually has very little to do with the overall story. Sure, this title does contain the very first appearance of the big bad guy, Darkseid. There are some other, generic apocalypse bad guys that show up during the run, but beyond that, it's not all that connected. One could probably skip this title and not feel like they were missing anything important to the Fourth World canon. The first original series Jack Kirby would produce at DC was The Forever People. The Forever People are Kirby's interpretation of the counterculture youth from the 60s, the flower children, the hope of a new generation. Presumably, they were meant to embody the future of the series. Or, perhaps more accurately, these were the characters that would assume the responsibility of the universe Kirby was creating once the overall conflict was resolved. This series establishes that Earth contains the secret to the anti-life equation, 
which is the equation the big bad guy, Darkseid, is seeking out. The young collective, the Forever People, have come to Earth to prevent Darkseid from discovering this powerful formula. By the way, the anti-life equation gave one the ability to control a person absolutely. This equation negates free will. In the end, Kirby intended Darkseid's quest for the anti-life equation to be somewhat meaningless. Meaningless in the sense that Darkseid's quest to obtain this equation would not give him the results he presumed. The second original series Kirby created for the Fourth World Saga was The New Gods. This series primarily focuses on Orion, the badass warrior from New Genesis, who comes to Earth to foil whatever plot Darkseid is hatching that month. As the series progresses, we learn that Orion is actually Darkseid's son. Orion was traded to New Genesis as a child in an effort to halt the war between New Genesis and Apocalypse. It's also discovered that Orion is horribly disfigured, but his hideous appearance is disguised by the mother box he wears. Further in the series, Orion is joined by the light-hearted Light Ray, and together they keep the war between New Genesis and Apocalypse from spreading to Earth. Many other notable characters are also introduced in this series. Characters such as Highfather, Black Racer, and Metron. In fact, a reasonable portion of this series takes place on New Genesis and expands upon the overall mythology that Kirby was establishing for the Fourth World. This series, more so than the Forever People, reveals much more about the worlds of New Genesis and Apocalypse. Basically, New Gods is the core of all the Fourth World comic books. It's integral to understanding the whole concept. The final series in the Fourth World canon is Mr. Miracle. Much like the Forever People, this series seems to hint that the title character is integral to the future. One would have to presume Kirby was setting Mr. Miracle up to be the leader of New Genesis once the overall conflict was resolved. After all, Mr. Miracle is the son of Highfather, the leader of New Genesis. Although Mr. Miracle is initially unaware of this fact. Of all the Fourth World titles, Mr. Miracle would be the title that lasted the longest, managing to go 18 issues before being cancelled, whereas the other titles were cancelled after the 11th issue. This seems like the title Kirby was most invested in. Scott Free is a character that is easy to like, and his ability to escape ridiculously complex death traps is kind of charming. Also, this title contains the appearance of what may be the most interesting character Kirby created at DC, the loving, the sadistic, Granny Goodness. One very notable aspect of this title is the sudden shift from being a fourth world title to being a standard superhero series between issues 9 and 10. What occurred is New Gods and Forever People were cancelled, and Kirby was asked to find another direction for Mr. Miracle, one that didn't include the fourth world mythology. In other words, DC liked Mr. Miracle, but they weren't so keen on him being associated with cancelled titles. So for half of Mr. Miracle's run, it's a fourth world comic book, and the other half is the wacky misadventures of Mr. Miracle and his supporting cast. However, in the final issue, Kirby does bring back the New Gods cast and has them attend the wedding of Big Barda and Scott Free. The Forever People are noticeably absent from the issue. Now, the reason these Fourth World titles were cancelled was for a few factors. Probably the most important of which was expectation. Kirby's move to DC was hyped up by editorial and heavily promoted in their comic books. It's not too much to say that DC expected to see excellent sales figures, and that didn't happen. None of the titles were failures, but they weren't massive hits either. It's likely there were people at DC that presumed a new Kirby title would sell much better than it did. As ridiculous as this is going to sound to everyone in the 21st century, DC titles cost 25 cents, a whole 5 cents more than the average Marvel Comics title. If you were a total nerd and could do basic math, you would likely buy five Marvel comics for a dollar rather than four DC comics for that same dollar. So all around, DC titles didn't sell as well as Marvel. And this ridiculous five cent difference likely hurt the sales of the fourth world titles. Late in the game, DC did drop the price of their comics to match Marvel's price, but by that time the damage had been done and sales for the fourth world titles didn't improve. To try and generate more interest in Kirby's DC output, the Fourth World titles were basically sacrificed for new titles like Commandy and The Demon, both of which premiered with a 20 cent cover price. One can't overlook the possibility that, at the time, Kirby's artistic style was also starting to stagnate, and his stories were, well, a tad simple in comparison to other titles. A diversity of content and themes were beginning to flourish in the industry and Kirby's old-school approach to storytelling looked anachronistic. Certainly it was creative and dynamic, 
but it was possibly less appealing to an audience that was being exposed to a wave of new artists like John Romita or Neil Adams. Kirby's DC output during the last year or so he was under contract was erratic. The writing duties on his most successful title, The Long Running Commandy, was eventually taken away from him, although he continued to provide artwork for that comic. DC also stopped requesting Kirby-drawn covers, and they seemed to publish as little Kirby content as they could manage. Essentially, DC was preparing for Kirby's departure. They were also lowering his profile by limiting his exposure. This was not a happy time for Kirby. When Kirby's contract at DC expired, he returned to Marvel, where he seemed to have another burst of creative energy. However, Marvel had changed a lot since Kirby was last there. While Kirby was respected for his past efforts, his current output was openly derided by staff members. After three years, Marvel and Kirby parted ways once again, and Kirby found himself working in animation. Over at DC, management changed hands. After a review of sales figures, it was decided that reviving both New Gods and Mr. Miracle would be a worthwhile venture. As a test of this theory, the final issue of First Issue Special contains a New Gods revival. The sales of that issue were strong enough that DC went ahead with the two planned revivals in 1977. Both series continued with their prior numbering, and they heavily expanded upon the Fourth World mythology that Kirby had established. Mr. Miracle would be cancelled within a year due to the infamous DC implosion, and the New Gods became a feature in adventure comics for two issues. The New Gods in particular need a mention, because the revived series and the two final appearances in adventure comics provides a conclusion to the New Gods saga. Now, the reason I'm not going into detail about the ending or the numerous changes made to the fourth world mythology during this time is because all of it is irrelevant. In 1985, Kirby would return to DC and provide the ending he intended for the Fourth World Saga. In fact, Kirby would completely ignore all of the work that had been published following the original cancellation of the series. The 1985 original graphic novel, Hunger Dogs, was supposed to be the conclusion to the overall Fourth World Saga. Kirby was given the opportunity to return and provide an ending to the story he started in 1971. Instead, it turned out to be a confusing, disappointing mess and there are a lot of reasons why that graphic novel isn't satisfying. In 1984, DC decided to reprint the entire New Gods series on high-quality paper stock. DC then approached Kirby and asked if he would be interested in supplying some new material that would provide a conclusion to the New Gods story. Kirby agreed, and he later turned in a 24-page story that, according to Kirby's inker, Mike Royer, concluded with Orion and Darkseid fighting to the death on the streets of Armageddon. Allegedly, DC rejected this story. They had just started going hard on merchandising and they weren't going to publish comics that killed off any characters that were slated to be toys. Like, for example, Darkseid. Of course, this is all based on the presumption that the ending included the deaths of both Orion and Darkseid. However, these pages, if they were produced, don't appear to exist. Or, at the very least, they aren't among the pages that Kirby is known to have submitted to DC. So, this may be an apocryphal addition to the Hunger Dogs story. Regardless, the pages Kirby turned in were rejected by DC. DC then suggested Kirby hold on to these pages and repurpose them for an original New Gods graphic novel. This graphic novel would be Kirby's opportunity to provide the conclusion he had always envisioned. This is how the graphic novel, Hunger Dogs, first began. Additionally, DC asked Kirby to draw a 48-page story for the final New Gods reprint series. This would be a bridge between the reprint series and the original graphic novel. This request came in while he was finishing off Hunger Dogs. Begrudgingly, Kirby agreed to this request. Moreover, during the process of writing and drawing Hunger Dogs, it was suggested that Jack might want to hire a writer. DC was, for the most part, unhappy with the work Kirby was turning in, especially the writing. Kirby didn't take the suggestion very well, and the relationship between himself and DC quickly eroded. Hunger Dogs appears to be a combination of Kirby, who was disgruntled by the process of creating this graphic novel, turning in pages just to get the job done, and an editorial team who had no confidence in the work they were receiving from Kirby, trying to make the best of what they were getting. At some point, Kirby gave up arguing with editorial about the quality of his work, and he turned in pages that ignored the suggestions that were given to him. In turn, editorial tried to take what they were given and make it conform to their expectations. 
when The Hunger Dogs graphic novel surfaced in 1985, it was basically edited to incoherence. The original order of the pages Kirby submitted were shuffled around. The prior pages that were rejected for the New Gods reprint series were also repurposed and inserted into the story. Allegedly, another writer was brought in to punch up the dialogue and to apply some continuity to scenes that were now out of the intended order. The end result was a series of events that felt both drawn out and disjointed. It was an ending of sorts, but it certainly felt anticlimactic, especially considering that it was supposed to provide closure to an expansive epic, which it did to a degree, but at the same time, it certainly feels like a contractual obligation rather than a labor of love. There is no doubt that Jack Kirby is a legendary creative genius. He contributed to the superhero genre in numerous ways. And with Stan Lee, they took a stagnant genre and gave it a vitality that exists to the present day. Nothing one can or will say will ever diminish these undeniable facts. However, it is hard to overlook some of the flaws in Kirby's work. And, perhaps, it's the fourth world content in which he was responsible for every aspect of the saga where those flaws become rather noticeable. Apparently, Kirby continued to work in the Marvel style while working at DC. That is, he had a plot in mind before starting the story, and then he would write and draw each issue as he went along. In fact, he would write the dialogue and captions directly onto the artwork. This can be seen in photocopies of his penciled artwork from that time. While this approach worked well to get a job done on time, the end result is something that lacks a good polish. Kirby's greatest weakness is the dialogue. It is rather terrible and clunky. Like the action scenes he's depicting, the words everyone says are loud, boastful, and slightly obnoxious. With that aside, the strength of Kirby's work outweighs the flaws. Where Kirby shines, and why he's so revered, is he was an idea machine. He'd throw out ideas like a crazy person, and most of them were pretty decent. This was Kirby's strength, even though many of these ideas were usually undeveloped. The magical quality of Kirby's writing, and what I think everyone talks around but never really defines, is that he placed ideas into one's head with an interesting phrase, like mother box, or torture orphanage, or Mobius chair. And these ideas would sit in a person's brain looking for a definition that Kirby never provides. It's an accidental technique, in my opinion, one that inspires a person to think about the vibe Kirby's laying down and then to define it for themselves. It makes a reader participate in the story, even though they are not consciously aware they are doing that. And, again, I don't think Kirby even knew he was throwing down some next-level psychological kung fu. I think Kirby just liked thinking up cool stuff and putting it on paper. At a casual glance, it is somewhat easy to dismiss Kirby's art style, especially his work during the 70s. Faces and body shapes look very similar, and the anatomy of most people is a little grotesque. However, while it may not look initially appealing, there is a sublime, abstract simplicity to everything he draws. That's what's easy to overlook, the abstraction in Kirby's work. Squiggly lines represent muscles and joints. Perspective is consistently skewed. Intent is heightened to an extreme. While it looks like an artist whose style has calcified, it's actually a style that has been refined or heightened to an economical extreme. All of these elements are intensely difficult to represent using an economy of lines, which is something Kirby did consistently and, seemingly, without effort. Kirby's designs are also next level. They have an immense cinematic quality that seem impossible to replicate. His architecture has a rather unique aesthetic. It's one that is singular and distinct. There is an impossible cosmic magnitude to it. In essence, the appeal of Kirby is he was simply an entertainer. Even in the fourth world, where he did intend to slowly reveal an epic saga, he did it without pretense. And that shows rather clearly in his work. Criticism and accolades aside, the fourth world was highly influential. The idea of separate but interrelated titles telling one grand story was rather unique at the time. It is something that is taken for granted nowadays, as both Marvel and DC used this technique for events and the lead-ins to events. Furthermore, Kirby laid down the idea that others have picked up and expanded upon many, many times throughout the ensuing decades. Specifically, superheroes are our new gods. They are our modern mythology. These influences are present today. They are refined and reinterpreted and updated to modern sensibilities. But the core of these concepts, 
are firmly rooted in the work Jack Kirby did on the fourth world.